All right. So this issue of Igabit, you know, the question at, at this point with his child when he was came down here from Montana was, is there evidence of Igabitrin toxicity? And uh, we typically do an exam under anesthesia, do electrophysiology. It turns out that many years ago when this drug was studied, Don Creel and I were among the investigators that participated in gathering data uh, that brought to the fore the issue of igabitrin toxicity in children. And in this child, uh, that is uh, you know, definitely an issue. And the thing that was striking with our exam under anesthesia uh, was these changes, depigmented areas from mid-peripheral retina out to the periphery, the optic nerve notably looks healthy. We, because of issues getting test accomplished, did not get an OCT during our recent exam and our anesthesia, uh, but we did do the electrophysiology that you saw. And the thing that struck me with that electrophysiology was that the cone uh, ERG, the flicker response, which is predominantly a cone response, all we saw were stimulus spi spikes. That was a grossly abnormal electroretinogram. The manufacturer of Sabral has recommended that testing be done every three months, including electrophysiology in all children on the medication. We have held the line in doing it here every six months, recently incorporated doing OCT. It turns out that retinal nerve fiber layer thinning has been identified as another component of this toxicity. In looking into this, there are a couple of things with this kid, and I want to show you some of the pictures. These are these areas of depigmentation that are present, and fortunately, the posterior pole looks relatively normal. One of the questions here is, is this sabral toxicity? And I apologize for the uh, flashing. I have no idea how to operate this when it works, let alone how to troubleshoot it. Um, so if anyone has a clue, uh, please jump in. Any of the residents, as far as is, you know, if we were to consider other things, what else should we consider? You've got an abnormal electroretinogram in an infant who's got borderline poor vision and some pigmentary retinal changes. RP. RP could be some sort of retinal dystrophy. The other question in a child who's got abnormal neurologic function is, is in my mind, was is there some evidence of a metabolic disease? It turns out that we have him scheduled to see Dr. Longo, who is our pediatric geneticist metabolic specialist. So we will hopefully have answers on that. In the interim, the plan quite uh, you know, forcefully to pediatric neurology was let's taper him off of Vigabitrin while we were sorting this out. We are going to bring him back at our next exam, we will do an OCT and we'll have more information. In terms of looking into this, what have we learned and what have I learned in putting this together for you? It turns out that Vigabitrin is an irreversible inhibitor of GABA aminotransferase. And when you have increased GABA, you have decreased seizure activity. Where is it most frequently used? At least 90% of the patients that I see this medication used in have tuberous sclerosis. Why is it the magic bullet for seizures in, in TS? That is an unknown. Now, the ERG changes that Dr. Creel identified years ago include a decrease in the cone B wave, decreased in flicker amplitude, and the thing that most people remember is absence of oscillatory potentials, those little spikes you see on the elevated portion of the B wave in the electroretinogram. Nasal uh, ret optic atrophy and nasal retinal, kind of segmental uh, retinal atrophy were described by Ray Bunsick at Hospital for Sick Kids in Toronto back in 2004 for monitoring, again, electroretinogram, fundus photos, and OCT. Now, one thing I learned that I was not aware of is this has been associated with a cumulative dose, greater than 1,500 grams of drug. So we're going to need to start recording that when we see kids. We've not been doing that. The other issue is question of does this have long-term implications? And there are at least two papers suggesting that it indeed does. In adolescents, 
with documented cerebral toxicity early in childhood when they were seen later, when one could do a Goldmine visual field um, and uh, um, do OCT looking carefully at nerve fiber layer thickness, there are abnormalities seen in adolescents from documented toxicity early in childhood. This is years off. Say. Years down the road. And, and this is really opening a can of worms. And then the other issue is these authors, uh, and this is a, 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 a French group of investigators published in Pediatric Neurology, presented VEP and ERG stimuli to selected parts of the retina. And what they found were that there were issues in the peripheral parts of the retina that they were that were abnormal when presenting these uh, this uh, uh, flashes both VEP and ERG uh, in school-aged children who had been exposed years earlier and these were school-aged children who had been on the medication that did not have documented toxicity so there's real question about this and reason for us to be following these kids closely and so uh, now Setting that aside, I want to, one other thing, you're in clinic, it's very busy, you get a text, and the text is from one of your radiology colleagues, and the text basically just says, what is this, and do you need to see the patient today? And here is the scan, and, and this is the, the only image I got, and yes, it was this fuzzy on my cell phone, and you see what looks like a lens here, and lens here, and not much of an anterior chamber. And so, I'm wondering, is this a child with anterior segment dysgenesis that they've discovered? Say, tell me more about the patient. It turns out that the patient is a healthy 12-year-old girl, head injured, CT from an outside hospital, reported to have perfectly normal eye exams, good visual acuity by mom. And this was an artifact. And I, I don't know in retrospect whether he sent this to me as a joke or seriously asking a question, but you want to, when things don't look right, you want to wonder about the source of the information. And back to the first case, questions, comments, particularly from our retina colleagues in neuro-ophthalmology as far as this issue of bigabitrin toxicity. Well, what percentage of all patients on, on this medication do you think end up having toxicity? We, we talk, and this is an extremely rare event. This is a rare occurrence. It, it's a rare occurrence. When we were doing, they're doing the initial treatment trials and we were doing electrophysiology, they were using much higher doses. The doses they're using now are much lower. And I have, this is the first patient in recent memory that I have recommended that they stop the medication. Almost all the other patients we've been on have had good electrophysiology and we've had good stable electrophysiology. And again, the issue with this first ERG to understand is when you put a patient under general anesthesia, it suppresses the EEG. When you suppress the EEG, you decrease the response that you're going to get with electroretinogram and particularly with the VEP. So that anesthesia can alter it. So comparing an awake study to an asleep study is not necessarily a good thing to do and draw firm conclusions. Yes? Not that I am aware of. Clearly, clearly the RPE looks like it's being impacted. Yeah, this is, if this is due to vigabitrin, this looks like RPE. And the other thing I'm going to do when we go back next with this child, and they've got to come down from Montana and we have to coordinate care, is I think it'd be wise to do an FA. We can easily do that now with the RETCAM. Um, and uh, Glenn Jenkins has been very good about coming to do FAs for us. Um, and, and helping us through that, uh, both with peds retina and pediatric ophthalmology services. And doing an FA, I think, would help sort out where this is. The other thing I thought, as far as the metabolic disease with this, could it be gyrate atrophy or something like that? And, but there, you've got loss of choroid. This does not look to me like loss of choroid. It looks like simple loss of RPE. I've never seen anything look just like this in any of the patients that I've either seen in person or published with vigabitrin toxicity. So I think the important thing is that the, the finding that this, this indeed is, can be uh, a permanent change and a permanent loss of damage. So it, well, and it, and it knows definitely knows how advanced that could be if somebody doesn't pick this up and then right. could extend the behavior. Well, the other plea I would make is that 
rather than having someone order the test, I think that having someone look at the eyes carefully and thoughtfully um, is, is highly uh, desirable in terms of trying to sort these things out. Yes? I mean, the hard thing I think about Sabrel is it's, it's an amazing drug for a lot of kids. And so it's not like, I mean, we, you, in some cases you have to have the discussion with parents, would you like to take them off this drug, which is the only drug that can control their seizures? Or uh, the, the trouble I've had with this drug is that when I put them under anesthesia and do these repeat ERGs, Sometimes they'll get a little lower, sometimes they're a little higher, and some of it, a lot of it has to do with under anesthesia. Um, uh, they're a little bit different, and it depends on how light the anesthesia is. And so I have trouble sorting that out, and these are usually very um, delayed children who you can't get much of an exam in clinic. And so it's hard to know that, but it is, a, uh, you know, if it's really getting lower and you look at their exam in clinic, and is it really worth putting these kids under anesthesia because uh, these are kids with lots of other developmental problems. Um, but this is the only drug that controls their seizures. Uh, it, it, it's, a very, it's a very difficult drug to deal with. Uh, what, what I said, that I'm impressed how kids with uncontrolled seizures just are developmentally stalled or regressed. They're in a vegetative state. I mean, and they're, they're, if you can't get the seizures under control, uh, their life expectancy goes to the teens. So, so this is this is often the option that the parents have. So I, I find that the parents are often very comfortable with the risks of vision yeah, loss because their child, for the first time, is developing. Their brain is not seizing, and they're starting to hit milestones. And it's so it's, it is. Right. It's a very complicated situation. But then they say, but you can put glasses on and fix it, right? Yeah. And, and that's the, the issue because those. But this issue of, of, of having a brain that functions is is important. And it is, a, I agree, a night and day difference. Dr. Warner. Uh, it, at uh, Nanos last year, um, one presentation oh. discussed uh, a prospective trial of um, Vigatrin okay. and uh, doing baseline prior to uh, taking the medication. And a, a very high percentage of the patients um, had abnormalities on RNFL, on electrophysiology, visual fields. And, uh, prior to prior to exactly right, and um, they they had they had the study go on for a couple of years, and um, there were they didn't see any statistically significant changes in visual fields um, or RNFL. Maybe the RNFL actually increased a little bit, um, and no patient had loss of acuity. Uh, one patient developed visual field constriction. So I mean I think that I think that that sort of called into question. Because a lot of the studies are done way later, after yes. the exposure, yes. and it's you know understandably a lot of patients were very young in enrollment and couldn't have done a pre you know, a pre treatment extensive testing. Right. Uh, but it's been somewhat um, controversial as to the really the frequency of how how often this really occurs compared to the potential benefit. It, it's a tough call. We try to get pre-treatment testing, you know, whenever possible. Um, in this situation we're in here, unusual for me, where I've never seen the child, and the very first time I see them, they've A, been on it for a long time, supposedly been tested, and things don't look good. And we're trying to sort out whether it's old or new, which is exactly the case. And I, and I also think of the point of the syndrome kids who, uh, you know, there's, there's often a reason why they have intractable epilepsy and end up on uh, Vigaprotrin, and may, that may definitely include a, a potential retinal issue that's related to their underlying yes. disorder rather than their well, drug. I'll bring additional info back. Yeah. Dr. Bernstein. Yeah, and just as a plug, we do have a genetic counselor that we're hiring <laughs> as of July 1st. You need to do genetic testing on a patient like this because you bring it up the idea, could this be a retinal dystrophy? In the yes. A retinal dystrophy. Yes. Things, so. And the genetic testing prices are coming down, so compared to a lot of other testing you're doing, it's the same. You're in the same ballpark now. That's and, uh, we're def they're already they're plugged into genetics yeah. already, and, and and hopefully we'll get some sort of answer in terms of an overall better overall diagnosis. All right, next. <laughs> 